Today, we're talking all about the concept of values. So where exactly do we get our values in the first place? And what is it that guides the decisions that we make? It's gonna be good. Let's get to it. Epic Online fam. Hey, if we haven't met yet, my name is Emily and I'm the pastor for Epic Online and welcome to Epic Everywhere, practical teaching to help you grow in your faith no matter where you're at on your spiritual journey. And happy Father's Day. If you're watching this on Sunday, it's a special day to celebrate all of you who are dads out there and all of you who are a father figure to someone. I just want to say thank you for all that you do. Although my dad wasn't necessarily around, I'm so grateful for the men in my life who stepped up to support me and encourage me and keep me on the straight and narrow. And I know that for some of you, you're struggling on a day like today. My husband lost his dad in 2017. And so today's filled with a lot of mixed emotions, which maybe you can relate to. Listen, whatever you're walking through, I'm so glad that you're here. And to celebrate Father's Day today, our, our Philly area locations are serving up root beer floats. I know, right? So I was trying to find a way to send them to you through the metaverse but no luck. So instead, I dropped a top-notch root beer float recipe in the hub for you to try. It's so delish. Not necessarily nutrish, but it's definitely delicious. So give it a try. And so to get to the hub today, you can text in by texting the word here to 215-999-8575, or you can scan the QR code. And that's going to give you access to our hub to grab that recipe and so much more. We also have a spot in the hub where you can share a prayer request and also ways that you can get connected and to give today. We even have a classic dad joke when you text in. I mean, who doesn't love a good dad joke, right? What do you think? You, you want another dad joke right now? Okay. I can tolerate algebra, maybe even a little calculus, but geometry is where I draw the line. Get it? Draw the line. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Listen, it's the beauty of dad jokes. They just leave you shaking your head in disappointment. Well, hey, I'm so glad that you're here. We're continuing our series, What a Wonderful World Today, answering some of life's toughest questions. Today, it's all about values. Where do we get our values anyway? Well, we're talking about it today. What do you wonder? <laughs> That's good. I thought it was going to be super specific and I was going to be way not ready to answer. That, that's a good question. What do I wonder? I consider myself a really curious person. I like um, learning things. Um, I just went back to school actually for that reason. I wonder about like the seasons and how like the trees can like change colors. I wonder how things work a lot of times. Wondering in a way that brings me a sense of awe is something that also brings me a lot of joy. Um, I think I wonder about religion. I wonder how we can hear God. When I wonder about God, I wonder if we would laugh together, if we would sing or tell jokes. Um, and just kind of what our interaction would be when we first meet each other. Hey everyone, my name is Paul. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Epic and it is Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Um, so this is actually going to be the third Father's Day since my dad passed away. And I can't help but think back and just reflect on some of the things that my dad passed on to me. One of those things was a, was a passion for maps and directions. I don't know if any other dads out here are like this, but my dad was one of those guys who, like, before you would leave, he would ask you, all right, what way are you taking home? And whatever you told him wasn't the right way, right? He's like, no, 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 you can't go that way, right? You can't go that way. You gotta go this way, right? It's gonna, it's gonna be way better. You're gonna miss all the traffic. And I used to make fun of him for that. Now, guess what? Now I do that, right? So he, he secretly brainwashed me over time. 
Uh, and there are so many other things that my dad passed on to me, like uh, taking care of cars, being a Steelers fan. He gave me an irrational fear of anyone being behind me on stairs because he would always chase me up the steps as a kid. Thanks for that, dad. So he passed on all kinds of things, right? Small things, big things that contributed so much to how I see the world and how I interact with the world and how I make my decisions. And I think that's the impact that a dad or a mom or a parent or a family member can have on us, right? So we're in this series right now called What a Wonderful World. And we've been looking at some big questions like, how do I know it's real? Or uh, who am I? And where did I come from? And why am I here? You know, just simple, like casual conversation topics. So now today we're gonna talk about this question. Where do I get my values? Uh, other terms that people might use here might be like morality or ethics. And any question of morality or ethics or values uh, really boils down to this. How am I supposed to live? Like, how am I supposed to live? What decisions are gonna guide me in life? Like, what, what, or what guides my decisions in life? Uh, there's a lot to talk about and unpack when it comes to the discussion of morals and ethics and values. But first, just a quick distinction. So there is what shapes our values and what should shape our values, okay? What, there's what shapes our values and what should shape our values. And they're not always necessarily the same. Sometimes they are but not necessarily. So to answer that first question, then what shapes our values? Uh, let's start with this. Every single person's morals and values are shaped by something. And usually some things, right? And that's the reality. Like we're all shaped and influenced by multiple things. Now we can get into a lot of philosophy and ethics and history in terms of what big things have shaped our values and ethics, uh, but I'm gonna just boil them down to a few simple things. Here they are. People's values are often influenced by family, experience, and culture. And obviously there's faith as well, but if we just take faith off the table for a minute, uh, those are three of the biggest and three of the most common, common values shapers for the average person. And so like I was talking about earlier, right? My, my dad was a huge factor in helping to shape my values. And this is true for just about all of us when it comes to family. This includes the good and the bad of our upbringing, right? This, this is the ways that our family took care of us and the ways they didn't. Uh, this is the, the things that our family explicitly taught us and the things they didn't, right? And that's directly related to experiences, uh, which also shape our values. So for example, the experience we had with our families growing up or the experiences we had in school. Uh, if we experienced significant trauma or even minor trauma, uh, that could shape our values. So for good or bad and better or worse, those experience, experiences often factor into our values. And then there's the culture around us. Like there is so much about the time and the place in which we live that can shape our values. Like growing up in the suburbs around here is going to shape you differently than growing up in a war-torn country across the globe. Like growing up in 2023, that's way different than living through the Great Depression. Uh, my mom was Korean and there's a lot that was different about Korean culture and the way that she grew up versus the culture that I found myself growing up in. And a huge part of culture now, obviously, is media. So in all forms of media, right? And all of the ways that that can influence our values as well. So family, experiences, and culture, the reality is that for most people, these three things have a huge say in influencing and shaping our values. And that could be good, or it could be very bad, or it could be anywhere in between. So for example, if you grew up in a culture, in a family that valued owning slaves, we've seen how that worked out. Wasn't good. Uh, in a perfect world, right, family should have a great deal of influence on shaping someone, but what if your parents were taught something harmful by their parents? Uh, what if their experiences shaped them in harmful ways? Uh, what if the culture around them uh, shaped them in harmful ways? I mean, you start to see how this can become very dicey, right? And not only that, but, but here's how most people, whether they're aware of those other factors or not, how most people approach values and morality. I am gonna figure out what's right and what's wrong, good and bad, on my own, for myself. 
And I'm just pointing out the reality of the situation here. Most people do this, and that even includes a lot of Christians. So it's very natural, right? It's very natural, very human for us to say, uh, I want to do what I want to do, and I don't want anyone else telling me what to do. Now, I want to give most people the benefit of a doubt that we want to live the right way, that we want to live a good life and to do the right thing. There might be some exceptions to that, okay? Uh, but most of us do. But if I'm the one who decides what's right or wrong and good and bad, we run into a lot of challenges. Like if I decide that I don't have to stop at any stop signs or red lights anymore, we start to have problems. I see this every day in the city, by the way. Um, that affects the rest of us, right? If I decide that your boundaries don't matter and I can cross them whenever I want, we're going to have problems, right? Uh, so between our family and our experiences and the culture we're living in and just trying to figure this out for ourselves, there's going to be a lot of conflict and tension as everyone tries to do this. You might be aware of these conflicts and these tensions uh, and a good chance that people are going to get it wrong, right? It, it, this gets tricky. It gets very messy. So here is where a Christian framework for values and morality comes in. As followers of Jesus, we have the opportunity and really a gift of having a guide, of having a North Star, something that can take into account, but ultimately transcend the influences of family, experience, and culture, and hopefully even influence them for the better. So I, I've done my best to try to summarize a values statement for a follower of Jesus in a single sentence, okay? So here, here it is. Christian values are driven by love, shown to us by God in Jesus Christ, that continually transforms us from the inside out. Christian values driven by love, shown to us by God in Jesus Christ, that continually transforms us from the inside out. So three important parts that I'm gonna to try to break down today. That if you want the basis for our values and morality in one word as a follower of Jesus, it's love, right? Christian values are driven by love. Please don't lose sight of that. The Christian ethic, everything that we do, right, is rooted in love. And we do need some elaboration here because love can mean anything, right? For some people, love looks like obsession. Uh, for some people, love is just a word that people use uh, to explain chemical reactions, right? And for some people, love is when the workers at Five Guys dump a bucket full of fries into your bag, even though you ordered a small. So if you know, you know. And so this is why we need this part. They're driven by love shown to us by God in Jesus Christ. Now, how do we know what love is and what love looks like? It's the love that's shown to us by God in and through Jesus Christ. And the third part of this is this, it continually transforms us from the inside out. So our life, our faith, our love, it's not just about doing the right things externally and earning our worth. It's not about arriving and then judging the people who haven't arrived. It is about accepting the love of God that's already there for us and then allowing it to transform us from the inside out continually over the course of our lives. So these are Christian values. We are to live our lives in love as shown to us by God and Jesus, and we need to allow ourselves to be changed and to be transformed constantly and continually from the inside out. Now, there are uh, some problems and some challenges, some complications in living this out as a follower of Jesus. It's like, as always, right? Easier said than done. So what I wanna do today is address some of the biggest challenges that we face and what we can do about them. There are, there are a million challenges, but here are the three big challenges we're gonna talk about today. Uh, the challenge of being wrong, the challenge of interpretation, and the challenge of moralism. Uh, and in a way, they're all kind of related. So when it comes to Christian values and ethics and morality in general, right, there are so many things to cover, but, but for today, we're gonna look at where we can begin when it comes to thinking about how to live out a Christian ethic to the best of our ability. So that being said, one of the biggest challenges to getting it right with our values and our morality is this, <laughs> we get it wrong. 
It, it seems so simple, but we have to start there. Like I have been wrong so many times in my life about small things and big things. And sometimes, right, I realize immediately that I'm wrong. Like, do you ever say something without thinking and then you see the reaction on the other person's face and you go, oh, I messed up, I've messed up. Um, so there's times we do that. And sometimes I don't realize I was wrong for years. And this is all of us, by the way, that's part of being human. Like we don't know everything and we're gonna get it wrong. Now, here's what's funny. Almost everyone can admit that you've been wrong sometime in the past. If you can't, you might be a psychopath. All right, but everyone can admit that we've been wrong at some point in the past, but almost nobody wants to admit that you're wrong now or that you like that you are wrong. Nobody wants to do that. Right now, there are so many reasons for that, but basically it's this cocktail of of our pride and ego and fear. So a really important principle for us today and for our lives as we try to live a life that honors God, a life that lives in the love of God is to be humble, is to be humble. And big part of being humble is being open to the idea that we can be wrong and I might be wrong right now. And I love this passage from the book of Micah. It says, what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And what does God want from us? To act justly, to love mercy and to walk with arrogance. We're always right, right? No, we walk with humility with humility. And a major part of humility is not assuming that I'm right and being very, very real with the fact that I can be wrong. Having a posture of, I always have something to learn and I might be wrong even now about this. And as people, as humans, we're we're really good at pointing out how other people are wrong, right? And we're really bad at seeing the ways that we're wrong. So here's a simple principle, a, a rule of thumb, Anytime you're reading scripture or listening to a message like this or just living your life, all right, always, 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 always start by looking at yourself first and foremost. So if you're ever listening to to a sermon and you think to yourself, you know who needs to hear this? That guy or this person right here sitting next to me, right? No, 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 no. Stop yourself. Please don't miss the work that God wants to do in you because you're so obsessed with the work you think he needs to do in someone else. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a time or place to correct someone else, to help them back on track, but we so naturally want to fix and correct other people, and we so naturally want to gloss over our own faults. You know, Jesus would say, don't worry about that small speck in someone else's eye when you've got a huge two by four sticking out of yours. So be humble, open yourself up with and and concern yourself first and foremost with what God is showing you about you. You know what else, by the way, really increases the chances of being wrong about things is when you take the lone wolf approach. Like, I'm gonna figure this out for me on my own, nobody else gets to tell me what to do. Because you know how like the number one way that any of us really find out that we're wrong? It's because of other people. They help point it out to us, right? It's community. That's, that's the value, by the way, guys, of community. Everybody says they want accountability and very few people actually set up their lives to be held accountable. Like people who put themselves on an island or in, or in a bubble or in an echo chamber, drastically increase their likelihood of being wrong and increase their likelihood of continuing to be wrong. So you start to justify all sorts of strange things when you're doing things on your own or you're in an echo chamber. So you and I, we're always in danger of being wrong. How do we resist that? Humble ourselves. We walk humbly with humility before God and before others and we stay in community so people can hold us accountable. So the next challenge then that we face in living this life of love is the challenge of interpretation. So in a nutshell, 
scripture can be challenging to interpret sometimes. I don't think I have to explain that too much, right? Like two people can read some of the same passages and then sometimes walk away with very different ideas about what those passages are saying. Now, there are thousands of issues that Christians have disagreed on and will continue to disagree on. And sometimes it feels like the scriptures might not be super clear about something. Like, you know, scripture's not telling me how many hours of Netflix is it okay to watch in a single night? One hour, three, eight? I don't know. And short of getting a PhD in biblical studies and like the Hebrew and Greek languages, which by the way, still doesn't guarantee that you're not gonna get it uh, wrong. Uh, what can we do? Like what, what can you and I do? So first of all, the things that we're talking about today in general are gonna help like walking humbly, right? Interpreting scripture requires constant humility. Uh, interpreting scripture, by the way, is also a thing to be done in community as well. Like making sure that my own personal take has a system of checks and balances and accountability. But there is a principle that can help the common everyday person like you and me with the challenge of interpreting scripture. It's this, use the crystal clear scriptures to help you interpret the tougher ones. Now, there are some key uh, pillar, uh, crystal clear verses and passages that can help us to navigate some of the trickier ones. It's, it's like when you're doing a jigsaw puzzle, okay? You don't start with all of like the, the, the 30 pieces that look like the exact same shade of blue sky, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like in a puzzle, you start where? You start with the corner pieces. Like I know where this piece is. I know what this piece is. I know where it goes. And then I build from there, right? It helps me to put the rest of the picture together correctly. So, I, you know, a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle is actually a great analogy for, for our life of faith. Like we start with a few cornerstone pieces and we slowly build out from there. And sometimes we try to jam a piece in a place where it doesn't go and we find out we were wrong. Uh, sometimes we lose a piece for a while. We totally forget about it. Uh, sometimes we get frustrated. And sometimes when a piece that we didn't know where it went finally clicks into place, there's a sense of wonder and gratitude and things start to make sense. Right? So to that end, I want to go over some of the crystal clear cornerstone passages that a follower of Jesus can rely on to help us figure out the rest of the puzzle of Christian values. So remember, here's our one sentence summary of Christian values. Christian values are driven by love, shown to us by God and Jesus Christ, that continually transform us from the inside out. Now, the most important thing here is love, right? And where do we get that from? The Apostle John writes one of the most beautiful and important three-word sentences of all time. God is love. God is love. You know, earlier in this series, we talked about how we're made by God and for God. And by the way, who is God, right? Who is God and what is God like? And what's the essence of God's being, this, this being who created us? It's love. And God is love. And the question always comes up, and it should, well, what does love look like then? Well, John keeps writing, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. So how can we live in love and make that love complete in our lives? Be like Jesus, right? And you might be thinking, okay, what does that look like? Well, earlier in the same chapter, John writes, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So, so what is love and how did God show us love? He sent Jesus. And in the person and the words and the actions and the life and the sacrifice and death and resurrection of Jesus, we have a model and a guide for what love is and what it looks like. We have the same, by the way, gospel accounts like to show us what Jesus did and said, and we can look at those to show us what Jesus is like and therefore what love is like. And we get a, actually a crystal clear dose of the Christian love ethic in Matthew's gospel account, which we're gonna go over now. And Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is. So basically, hey, what does this all boil down to? Give it to me in one or two sentences. And Jesus says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. 
And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything can be summed up in those two commandments and those two sentences. And so here we have this crystal clear passage, crystal clear scriptures that lay out for us who God is, what God wants for us. And what's more, in addition to these, I'd suggest a couple more passages. Uh, one of those is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's where you get into like love is patient, love is kind. And Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. This is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, we just did an entire series on the fruit of the Spirit. And basically, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 that we're going to know who people are, really, by the fruit they produce. Is that good fruit or is that bad fruit? How do we know what this fruit should look like? Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what good fruit looks like. These are passages, by the way, that if you're a follower of Jesus, you should essentially have memorized. Like they're crystal clear, cornerstone type passages. And you should continue to revisit them again and again to assume humility and to come to these passages, right? Assuming that there's work that God still wants to do in you as it relates to these things. And we could do this, like we could get into all of the examples of how other people who call themselves Christians do very unchristlike or unloving things. You know, like we can, the list goes on, like slavery, racism, discrimination, cruel behavior, okay? Uh, it's easy to get preoccupied with that. And we could talk about that all day. But hey, there's a lot of work that God wants to do in you and that God wants to do in me as it relates to becoming more and more like love and more and more like him. So, Use these scriptures, use these cornerstone scriptures to open yourself to what God is doing in your heart, to keep his love as modeled by Jesus as your North Star, and let that help you navigate some of the tricky, complex situations that we have to face every day. So find your cornerstone passages and work out from there. The next challenge as it relates to living out this Christian life is, is really the challenge of moralism. So in a nutshell, here's what moralism is. It's like we start to value outward appearances and doing the right thing to achieve righteousness. Like it makes you find your worth in achievements and actions. And it also, by the way, really increases your likelihood of judging other people's actions. And it's worth noting that anyone who adheres to a set of beliefs, religious or not religious, will really tend toward moralism. Like these are, these are the right things to do and to believe, and if you don't do them, you're out. But remember this, Christian values are driven by love, shown to us by God and Jesus Christ, that continually transform us from the inside out. Paul writes in Romans that we should continually be transformed by the renewing of our minds. He also writes this in Ephesians, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. This is the gift of God. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And here's the thing. Our culture is all about production and achieving for your worth. That is not the ethic for a Christ follower. For us, it's about being humble enough to know that I get it wrong. And I get it wrong a lot. It's being humble enough to know that I need the grace of God. That's Christian morality. We need the love of God. And because we've received and accepted the love of God, we love each other the way he's shown us to love. And day by day, we remain open to that love and allow that love to transform us from the inside out. That is the Christian life. Now, like I said before, uh, my dad passed down a lot of things to me, but maybe the best thing that my dad gave to me was this model of a life of faith. Because my dad knew that he got it wrong. In my childhood, you know, he was angry and, and he was a lone wolf type of guy. Like nobody told him what to do. He was actually famous in my family for just disappearing for huge periods of time. I'm also, by the way, slightly convinced that he was in the CIA. That's like my own little family conspiracy theory. Um, you can talk to me about it some other time. But he didn't have 
good ways to cope with his anger. So he'd bottle it up or he'd drink too much. This is, this is how I knew my dad as a child for me. But my dad had the gift of discovering the love of God and he allowed that love to change him from the inside out. And I saw him transform over the years from an angry lone wolf type of guy who used all sorts of things to cope with his problems into being a patient and loving and kind person who when he died, my dad was neck deep in loving community and relationships and just an exuberance for life. So the best gift that he ever gave me was to pass that example on to me and to point me to something bigger and more lasting than himself. Values that transcended his own wisdom, his experience, his culture, as well as mine. And so I, I'm forever grateful for that gift that, get, that my dad gave me to point me to Jesus and entrust me to his love. And I'm hoping that you have that same gift as well. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for your love. God, the, the love that you have shown us in Jesus Christ, the love that you are surround us with and move toward us with every single day. God, I pray that you would help us to uh, remain humble, to open ourselves to your love, to accept and to trust your love and, and your grace and to allow that to continue to transform us day by day by day to live out the love that you've modeled for us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Such a great message from Paul, and I'm so grateful that he shared his dad with us today. It's pretty powerful that even though Paul's dad is no longer here, his wisdom and his impact live on, and it's blessing all of us today. Well, we all have a next step of some kind to take today. Maybe today is the day that you're deciding to follow Jesus. We would love to celebrate with you and support you and provide you with some resources in your journey. So go ahead, click the button, follow Jesus in the hub. Maybe your next step is to keep learning about what we discussed today. We got you. As a part of our series, we're providing you with extra content each episode to keep you growing. So head over to the hub to access that today. And if you're new today, we are so grateful that you are here. We would love to see you back here next week and definitely take time to text in because when you do, we've got a free t-shirt that we can mail out to you just to say thanks for hanging out with us today. Well, before you go, take time to like, comment, subscribe, and share this with someone else to help us encourage more and more people. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you right back here next week.